Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening to folks on the East Coast and greetings to audience around the world. Welcome to the sixth and final event of our Media Care Talk Series Season 1, hosted by Suraj Israni Center for Cinematic Arts at UCISD. I am Wintel Ma, a third-year PhD student in literature and the co-organizer of this talk series. To kick off our event today, I would like to acknowledge that UCSD is built on the unceded territory of the Kumeye Nation. Today, the Kumeye people continue to maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions as vital members of the San Diego community. We acknowledge their tremendous contributions to our region and thank them for their stewardship. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors Film Studies Program, Department of Communication, Department of Visual Arts, 21st Century China Center, Institute of Arts and Humanities, Program for the Study of Religion, and Department of Literature, as well as Tara Nadell, Rihanna Swice, Anthony King, and Michael Trigelio for their tremendous help. The video recording of earlier talks given by Joshua Nevers, Hannah Ziven, and In Chen is now available on the YouTube channel of UCSD Arts and Humanities. Please subscribe to our channel so you can discover more about our talk series. I will post the link to the channel later on in the chat. Now it is my honor to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Bishnupriya Ghosh. Uh, Bish Bishnupriya Ghosh is faculty in the English and Global Studies departments at the UC Santa Barbara. She has published two monographs, When Born Across, Literary Cosmopolitics in the Contemporary Indian Novel, and Global Icons, Apertures to the Popular on Global Media Cultures. Her current work on media, risk, and globalization includes the co-edited Rutledge Companion to Media and Risk, and a new monograph, The Virus Touch, Theorizing Academic Media, uh, published by Duke University Press this month. So congratulations, uh, Bishnu. Uh, she is starting research on media environments of viral infection in a book of essays tentatively entitled Epidemic Intensities. So welcome, Bishnu. The floor is yours now. Thank you, Wentao, and everyone who put this together, and especially thank you for everyone who's showing up because it's the, you know, I know how the quarter is rushing to an end. And it's also a special pleasure to have Lisa as my um, interlocutor conversationalist here. Uh, her work in uh, has sort of inspired some of the medical clinical parts of this project. So um, it, it's a real pleasure, but let me get started. I'm gonna time myself. So we have plenty of time for uh, conversation. Um, I really wanted to talk um, about something rather low tech and ordinary and the ordinary sort of paper file, which could be a folder, which cards and notes stuffed in it. And this is sort of on the other opposite end of um, the spectrum from media of care, like you know precision medicine or performance enhancers and so on and so forth. And I've been following uh, Cornelia Wiesman's um, uh, book, uh, uh, Files, Laws and Technology. And let me share my screen. I'll just put up a quote from her book. I'm not going to go through it, but it gives you a little sense of her reading as files, uh, as storage technologies, essentially. And the storage that I'm interested in is, of course, the chronic record of HIV AIDS uh, infection, particularly to keep people on the antiretrovirals. And that's the sort of the domain of my study. So let me just start here. Okay, can you all see that? Yeah. Okay. Um, right. Um, now, of course, files can be very sophisticated. 
right? So the, the Christian Oster has uh, produced a marvelous uh, research on the electronic medical record, algorithmically contained, um, confidential, so on and so forth. But the files I'm talking about are sort of non-standard forms. And what's useful about Wiesman's description that you see here is She's very interested in files as structuring our social relationships. I have a file on you, right? That structures a certain kind of social relationship, but it's also a kind of an accumulative technology. You can keep adding to them. Unlike the original docu document, which has restricted circulation, it's an original and copy, you can keep adding things to this file. And this sort of capaciousness and flexibility, the dynamism, you can keep adding and subtracting, they grow and they decay, is precisely, I think, what makes it an interesting object to think about care, right? And I'm, I want to really think uh, with you about uh, the series and to think about how files give us a sense, a document or technology that represents um, health as a multi-form practice. Because what you have in the file are various kinds of notes that show a protracted negotiation of what health should be or can be, rather than one person's interpretation, right? So what I want to look at is actually files that are stored at two, what are called points of care in a massive um, global biomedical uh, infrastructure. One of them is this uh, the Sanjeevni outfit at the Hamsafar Trust Clinic. And Hamsafar Trust is, of course, the largest LGBTQ plus organization in India. And so they have a great deal of social trust, particularly with MSM men who have sex with men and transgender communities. So Sanjeevni is an outfit that takes care of um, getting drugs and keeping people on their meds. And they've been operative since 2003. And the second uh, uh, part, uh, the second uh, clinic that I look at more briefly is actually this amazing phenomenon on what is called the HIV art social clubs. So these are clubs where people meet, they exchange information, they get their drugs, they get their blood taken and so on and so forth. And you see here, of course, Fanel Bogashu, who actually started the first one um, under the MSF's um, uh, guidance. And it was so successful that this has now become a kind of a, a model for, for HIV art delivery 2.0. So I want to look at these two particular clinics uh, to follow what some uh, folks like Melinda Cooper, Catherine Walby, uh, Vin Nguyen and others have argued that, you know, at the peripheries uh, of the global south, you have these points of implementation, points of care, um, whose value, value, they're sort of devalued in the sense that, as you know, in the HIV story, you have the big discovery of the antiretrovirals and the the sort of credit goes to the biomedical discovery. Yet still after 40 years, the 67% of HIV affected people are on the drugs and they've been managing uh, HIV. It's called managed HIV now because of a massive distributed collective experiment, right? And that sort of experiment takes place all over in these dispersed points of care. So while in very resource rich settings, and I won't just say global north and global south, because as we know, the global south is a amoeboid cartography. <laughs> There's a lot of global south here in the United States, for instance, right? So uh, I would say that in some ways in resource rich uh, um, uh, settings, HIV has become a privately lived condition in the doctor's office. And also you have a lot of smart technologies like self-testing, viral kits, and so on and so forth. But we also know elsewhere, there's been a very different story. And the story we often hear is about the whole fight over drugs, you know, CIPLA in India hooking up with uh, the treatment action campaign in South Africa. That's a story of bringing, uh, making affordable, the drugs affordable that we have heard. But I think what is not really focused on is how at these clinical points of care, you actually have a certain amount of knowledge production of how to think about infection, 
right? So it's not just implementation. It's not just resistance. It's not just activism. Those are really important. But I think health has been really redefined at these points of clinical care. So it's a crafting of health practices that I'm interested in, particularly for these series, because I'm interested in the mode of care that we evidence in these blood files. Um, that are critical to what I would say is our pandemic futures. We're kind of assured that pandemics, maybe not at the scale, but will keep, keep coming, right? Um, so the blood files that I'm talking about today are kind of local and particular blood pictures, but they're also what I would say expansive attunements to unfurling infection topologies that are beyond any kind of individual blood sample. In them, we find the viral load. So the, all these medical files actually, uh, you know, they store um, chronic viral load, right? Whether you're being un in undetectable or not. But also there's a noise and redundancy in these files. A lot of extraneous material, right? Uh, that apprehends infections fearsome extensivity. So I'll just refer very briefly to my uh, book. These are the chapters because, you know, why this apprehension? Why this sense of not just one, one environment, but many? You'll notice in chapters two, three, and four that the book really moves through several scales. There's a molecular story in extracellular fluids the clinical story in human bodies and communities, this is chapter three, that's the one I'll talk about today. And then the book ends with a larger story, an ecological story of zoonotic spillovers in tropical forests in which, in, uh, which are the environments for uh, reservoir hosts. In this regard, the book actually tries to make the argument for an emergence, the unfolding of the epidemic as a multi-level non-linear occurrence, as social and political as it is biological and ecological. But the problem is to grasp the enormity of the problem, right? And this, this will to thinking emergence is not a theoretical uh, exercise. I argue that actually it's quite historically urgent. Ever since the viral storms of the late 20th century, the sudden emergence of viruses like HIV, Hunter, Marburg in the early 80s, we know that medic, uh, um, uh, epidemics are more than medical uh, emergencies. They are certainly social calamities for populations slated for social death. And of course, we know the, the politics of HIV AIDS and in COVID-19, uh, of course, we saw a replay of what I see as something like population culling. But there are also ecological calamities, deforestation, industrial agriculture, wildlife trading that routinely create conditions for cross-species spillovers. So 71% of viral emergences uh, are spillover events, right? So this is one of the viruses, Rift Valley fever. So we may actually rely on medical solutions, vaccines and therapies, but these are often expensive and always inequitably distributed solutions, which are stop gaps. And so one of the things that the book argues is not to give up on these solutions, of course, I'm in by no means an anti-vaxxer, but to consider how they might obscure the long view to think of life as a relational unfolding that makes it critical to articulate human health animal health and biodiversity. This is what is now understood as planetary health or structural one health. This is a difficult pro uh, prospect. And of course, you know, the latest version of this is we'd rather believe the lab leak theory, right? We'd rather believe human beings created this than to, uh, to actually acknowledge it's our anthropogenic conditions that we've created, yeah, which need large scale structural change, right? It's far easier to put it, put the blame in human hands. This is why uh, epidemic media is so important. We know that acute infectious diseases are sudden fluctuations in multi-species relations, life wanes for the animal or human host and flourishes for microbes. And this fluctuation 
institutes of species difference between us. In the case of viral emergences, the different partitions, the virus and human, currently that is SARS-CoV-2 and us. And we always, as President Trump said, we're facing an invisible enemy, right? That we take a warlike stance towards viruses. Epidemic media like the one that we've been watching, this is a Johns Hopkins uh, um, University map, compose these multi-species relations as calculable distributions that you see it in your PCR test. You see, you know, X number of viral particles and Y amount of blood, but this is the demographic scale, right? The reproductive rate of the virus seen cartographically in a cartographic form. So an epidemic emerges through media like this. From the Latin root emigere, emergence signifies something new and something that appears. Media technologies and forms are central to making infection legible. In turn, how we think about infection, how we shape it, actually defines life, what kinds of life we value and how in our communities. And as we turn to the sciences for solutions and hope of deliverance, we come across characterizations that necessarily uh, isolate epistemic objects. And of course, this is a very well-known uh, spiked orb, right? HIV entering the human cell. And this is by um, uh, one of the people I was working with is Janet Iwasa. She's an animator. And this is called the asteroid aesthetics, right? You always have the virus come like in an existential struggle, sort of coming into the cell like an asteroid hitting Earth. And this, despite the fact we know from the Human Microbiome Project that we rely on bacteria and viruses for health, right? You still have this kind of aesthetic. Now, these media forms, this one in particular, was made for public edutainment, and they're necessary for controlling infection when epidemics erupt as emergencies. The biological sciences are at the forefront in the making of epistemic objects, and here I draw on STS, and medical humanities scholars who have led the way in thinking about how particular configurations of matter that we name life have been objectified and located. So I'm thinking of Hannah Landecker's work on laboratory practices, Lisa Cartwright's work on medical imaging, Natasha Myers's work on proteins, and so many others. During COVID-19, of course, so many of us have followed clinical and medical research, virological and epidemiological research, hoping for antibodies, trying to spin down the source of our infection in seeking out the origin of COVID. Part of the book then focuses on the scientific constitution of the problem. And here are the sort of the three, the, the list of labs and sites that I look at. As you'll see, I'm focusing on chapter three. And in each of these sites, what is interesting is these processes, uh, you can see that, you know, there's a making of this episto isolated object and environment, but actually the processes of mediation are far more complicated than the first, than we might imagine at first glance. Epidemic media might objectify to make a particular multi-species relation comprehensible, X amount of virus in Y amount of blood, but the very act of making performing involves sensing something that is not amenable to capture, a relational sense of life, uncontainable, unfurling beyond the environment we try to control or regulate. I call this experiential sense, this apprehension, the virus touch. It compels us towards infection topologies beyond the abstraction of a value-laden object such as just the viral load count, right? And this is actually what is most uh, um, uh, productive about the file. It's very bagginess. It's non-standard bagginess is, is actually what makes it uh, more attuned to infection topologies. So let me turn to this chapter on the blood files, which I start with in the clinical retrovirus lab where the blood specimens were probed for viral RNA or DNA imprints. 
plotting the processes of mediation. I tracked one blood specimen. They were really kind to me. One of the technicians had drawn her own blood when before I actually I actually started observing. So I watched the process uh, through uh, uh, one day and then went back. So I tracked the specimen that was, was multiplied into samples, then separated into elements. And you can see the slow separation probed for viral and in RNA in the case of HIV, and then rendered in numeric terms. The viral load represents infection as X number of viral particles and Y millimeters of blood. Here, the scientific performance enacts an epistemic cut, as uh, several scholars have argued, in the fluctuations, in the changing multi-species distributions in blood. An object, viral particles emerges composed within an environment, the blood as our interior milieu. But if we look beyond the media form of the viral load to the processes of mediation, to how this media is made, then our orientation to the locations of infection changes. And there are three things I look at here. These are uh, the storage of, of frozen blood samples. Uh, then the database in which blood is stored as data, and then the blood pictures in the medical file. Now, in when I was watching uh, epi the, the, the making of the blood sample to, and the data actually, two things kept surfacing. One was, and I'll show you a really bad picture of myself, which didn't make it into the book. Um, one was this obsession with the safe handling of blood. Right. And there were grumbles about bad habits. And the, the, these grumbles actually recognize the unassailable transitivity of the vital medium, the fear that actually still haunts our blood donation policies. Right. Uh, the, the clinical medicine lab is necessarily concerned only with the interior milieu of one patient bounded by our skin or epidermal limit. But the lively relations that we know as infection do not heed this boundary. This, and this is always the problem of contagion. In the safety protocols, the gloves, the wipes, the hazmat suit, there is an inadvertent acknowledgement of the milieu interior's relation to the social and ecological milieus beyond the patient's body. And these are sort of added back right in the medical file as demographic data on your group, your neighborhood, your migration routes, or as epidemiological data, right? Co-infecting agents, mutations. So you have this sort of nested, a sense of nested environments if you really look at how these media are made. And on the other hand, you also have this worry about quality data. And in the site B, of course, one of the things that's uh, that's very prevalent is uh, the, the tuberculosis bacteria, which was a co-infecting agent. And initially that was thought to be the primary infection and it was skewing some of the results with the HIV, right? Until they realized, and you see the patient card here, you draw blood, but you also draw sputum, right? BNS in every visit. So you actually look at the co-infection and then separate the two uh, distributions. So th there is this attempt to actually uh, sort through what is now called dirty data and clean it up. And this dirty data actually tells you about the specificity of a particular disease milieu, the ecological specificity. Each patient treatment card, as you see on the right, is a chronological record of inf infection. This is cross-referenced with the HIV art club registries that record the social temporalities of labor, time travel, and age, and the many demographic variables that define the social milieu. Putting together the cards and registries, the blood files, feature life as a series of biological snapshots, capturing fluctuations in multi-species relations. But life simultaneously appears in its multivalent socialities as the clubs craft singular HIV life ways, as they're called, for individuals and for social groups. In this way, the blood files at clinical points of care remain attuned to the multilinear emergence of infection, right? So alongside these, this sort of theoretical insight into infection, how do we understand the process of mediation that, uh, that are the blood files as care? And this is getting to uh, the, uh, this series. And here I want to turn 
to the medical records kept by Sanjeevni in Mumbai as they assemble the Kronos of HIV. As a multi-pronged organization, Sanjeevni is a small scale and community based. It exemplifies all the ways, ways in which such organizations address the social materiality of a specific disease milieu. This outfit maintains records, keeps track of registers, people living with AIDS, and follow up with referrals and health visits. The Sanjeevni team I met included HIV counselor Santosh Karamba and HIV AIDS activist Urmi Yadav. And this is Urmi, who is one of the few who uh, agreed to be actually photographed. So you'll see her in many of, uh, many of the slides. And she had returned from the Durban AIDS conference of 2016 when I went there. The third interviewee whose medical records were stored in the offices displayed his file so I could better understand the particularities of the storage system. And it was interesting that this particular interviewee kept referring to himself, his chosen uh, pronoun, as a key population. And, and this actually indicates the ways in which uh, very small scale units like this actually parley with standardized categories of global epidemic management, right? This is the language that the MSF uses or the WHO uses um, uh, to, to make uh, managed HIV possible. But what he drew my attention to was the fact that it was Humsafer Trust's social credit in the wider MSM and TG communities that made them one of the success stories of managed HIV. And of course, this again and again, you see this with these grassroots organizations. So the Sanjeevni uh, facilitators handle the registration and temporal records of individuals under their care, streamlining testing and treatments for HIV co-infections at several hospitals. And when I went in, of course, I was talking to them and I kept eyeing those cabinets at the back, thinking about what kinds of files uh, they may hold. And of course, the main thing here is now to have follow the global loss to follow program that is to keep everybody on their meds. This is the sort of the frontier in HIV management. But of course, that is only one part of their portfolio. Sanjeevni hosts a litany of social programs. There are yoga classes, uh, there are, there's nutritional advice, uh, there, there's advice on dietary needs, um, advice on medical histories, and also some address about uh, economic constraints and sexual practices. So that it, it's a whole uh, uh, sort of plat package of things that, um, uh, that occurs. At the time of my visit, each person had a ruled exercise book that was populated with blood data drawn from tests every six months. Standardized numeric data, date of draw time and place ensured clinical chronology. These were complemented by informal notes about missed visits, co new co-infections and other vital statistics. The informal notes embedded the numeric blood composition, and this is important, sort of the object, the numeric blood composition or viral load within the patient's disease milieu and life circumstance. In such notation, a blood picture emerges, translating technical notations of infections into a local grammar that is inclusive of everything from urban conditions, neighborhood changes, transportation routes, medical facility changes, to historical experiences like weather events or political disruptions. So the, and the classificatory system for these blood files registers the somewhat precarious circumstances of the Sanjeevni friends, as they are called. Since social strong social stigma prevents friends from keeping records at home, their medical files are stored under the Humsafer Trust offices and filed under the friend's mother's name. The nomenclature protects against disclosure. Only the Sanjeevni friends can request the files once they give the counselors the name as password. And most of this communication for the chronic visits is done through WhatsApp, as most things in India. Many of the friends are socially vulnerable because they are LGBTQ+, and they cannot divulge their zero status at home. 83% of those on art at Sanjeevni are MSM, and 17% are transgender. This was in 2016. They've actually really expanded since then. Sanjeevni counselors enable friends to navigate anger, fear, frustration, and sometimes suicidal ideation. So the moniker friends 
uh, indicate Sanjeevani's physical and virtual spaces as safe spaces that engender social trust necessary for cro successful chronic blood surveillance. The blood pictures in the medical file reflect the biological social character of blood and these, this is translated into blood data to individual friends. The fact that transgender and MSM patients return for periodic blood tests already indicates the depth of Sanjeevni's social credit. A recent um, uh, assessment in 2000, uh, 2020 put art retention at 85%, which is really high. Um, during the interview, Urmi Yadav that you saw made the point clearer in her experience of a hospital visit with Santosh Karamba, the HIV AIDS counselor. In their joint recollection, not only was it clear that Karamba took slights to Urmi personally, but Urmi found strength in Karamba's visit, uh, witness to the hospital's phobic response to their needs. In other words, the blood pictures traded on social credit. This is why institutions like MSF cannot actually function without local grassroots organizing for the implementation of HIV treatment and care. So there's Urmi in the middle, uh, is a big presence actually in Mumbai. Yeah, uh, has a dance troupe, is an activist, is an ambassador for Sanjeevni and so on and so forth. And what is interesting here is going back to Wiesman, you know, she traces the files from times when they were an administrative dispatch in the Prussian Empire, then how they become part of modern state bureaucracies, right? When our files, um, you know, think of your green card file or your immigration file, governs your relationship to the state. In this case, this so she underscores the role of these storage technologies in mediating relations between individuals and states, corporations, and bureaucracies. The constantly updated files at Sanjeevni mediate MSM and TG patients' relations with national and global medical infrastructures. So one of the things that has happened through, um, you know, these carrying, Urmi is very active in taking the files to the hospital and, you know, sort of pointing out what's in them and this constant act of translation, that in, in some ways, this kind of, um, uh, they use the file in terms of a social demand for more state uh, dispensations of medical care. In this sense, the file that initially structures one's encounter with an indifferent state bureaucracy, motivates participation in the, in the form of a push for more effective state dispensations. The more precarious the circumstance, the higher the therapeutic value of lay experts such as Santosh Karamba. Uncertainties arising from changing residencies, shifting work schedules, and overlooked outpatient clinics are major impediments to maintaining the kind of chronological medical file necessary for the sequential tracking of infection intervals. It is up to the Sanjeevni health counselors to store blood in legible compositions to mark the periods and region, uh, uh, reasons for discontinuities. And then they also find workarounds. So sometimes uh, this blood archive is haunted by impermanence. Sometimes people move away uh, and the file, so the, the counselor can make a call uh, to discard the file. So the materiality of the disease milieu continually determines the vitality of blood, whether or not the blood record will stay. The interior milieu then is always already structured by the constraints of the disease milieu. The blood files then, summing up the blood files here um, at the Sanjeevni Clinic are heterogeneous because they contain all the information relevant to maintaining chronic surveillance. The counselors struggle to reconcile singular patients' needs with the macro imperative of viral load tests. They make notation of weather conditions, nutritional change, water scarcity. There is singularity to each medical profile in the pragmatic reinsertion of the interior milieu, the viral count into the disease milieu. In all these ways, the blood files exemplify capacious technologies that accumulate and organize change while remaining opening to dynamic, lively materialities. These non-standardized media recognize infections, infections extensive topologies, even as they document the care 
of modern practitioners. And modern practitioners is a term that I'm using from Isabel Stengers, who says, you know, the best kind of um, uh, uh, the, the best kind of address uh, in addressing infection topologies, the best kind of care is actually from people who are willing to move across their domains of expertise, scientists included. Health in these files becomes a protracted negotiation between a range of actors and the patient who undertakes the not so easy and yet ordinary clinical labor of popping a pill. So I want to now bring this back to the, the idea of media care, right? And the last few minutes here, I want to spend on uh, thinking about health after HIV, right? So one of my inspirations for yoking the global and planetary in the ways that you saw uh, is decolonial uh, theorist Michelle Murphy's call to think life otherwise. Now, Murphy's been writing about the drift of PCBs, hormones, and soils. And she says, you know, these are, these are always analyzed at molecular scales, but there are large structural relations that shape the molecules, right? So this is called molecular uh, colonialism, as we know. She says it where you live has everything to do with how much PCB you have in your blood. Right now, if we think about what has happened during COVID, uh, how some bodies became more capable of handling infection than others because of long term inequities, right? In healthcare access, nutrition, housing, India's uh, stay at home order, for instance, the million uh, uh, migrant march, uh, that stay at home uh, order was predicated on people who had homes, right? So there is a, we've seen this unfold uh, in COVID. in many ways. So she really talks about altered lives, uh, living on meds, living with chemicals, as an ongoing violence of late industrial capitalism that no one can escape. But also she calls attention to the everyday surviving of vulnerable communities that, despite their daily depredations, pursue life otherwise. Now, if we transpose Murphy's iconic PCBs with iconic viral pathogens, HIV AIDS politics of survival in the last decades serves as an exemplar of living life otherwise. And this was sort of the start of my project. At times performed in spectacular forms, HIV AIDS activism played a critical role in forging what I call the current epidemic episteme as protracted negotiations between multiple stakeholders reconstituted the global pandemic's eventfulness as well as its locations of injury. And you know, apart at, at least before SARS-CoV-2, because the HIV AIDS was such a long wave, four decade long pandemic, it has taught us a lot. And probably in that ways, it has commandeered the most attention, except probably with the exception of smallpox before that. Um, and so one of the things, of course, that has come up now is staying undetectable is the quotidian for those on antiretroviral therapies. But as ever, for those on scarce resources, medicines, yes, but also nutrition, housing, and transport, altered life, as Michelle Murphy calls it, can be intensely precarious. This global history, and I've been writing a series of essays on this, eschews a reading of the global as simply a homogenizing topi. And when we say global, we often talk about global capital, right? The global biomedical infrastructure. We know that is very important because that connectivity turned HIV emergence in human populations into a geographically extensive infectious disease. There were many strains of HIV, and it is only one HIV-1 group M that actually becomes the global pandemic. The others remain uh, endemic. So the global transportation, global capital, very important. As the extensive time spaces of HIV infection grew, global institutions came to constitute this infectious disease emergence as a globally synchronous experience, right? But I think there's another understanding of the global as an incomplete set of varied experiences and an un geopolitically uneven stratified global. And here we have vast experience, archives of experience that make for starkly different pandemic intensities and complexities across the world. These differences tell us that global synchronicity does not imply universality. 
Pandemics always emerge une unevenly across global regions, while global institutions strive for a common strategy. We know this well from what critical global health studies and, of course, Paul Farmer's magnificent oeuvre on infections and inequalities and his writings, of course, on HIV AIDS uh, knowledge domain. For today, what's important here as I close is what this striated uneven sense of a global topology means for the story of managed HIV. It is a story of many battles over healthcare and infrastructure, over pharma distributions and patents. These struggles have changed how we think about health, how we manage it, and what we uh, what it can be. And so, you know, it's very interesting to me that at this point, um, and right in 2020, 21, there was a series of books on the AIDS crisis, right, during COVID as a kind of an object, historical object lesson. It's a four decade evolution from the panic of early AIDS to the post 1995 pharmacological triumph to the projected end of AIDS, perhaps now upended by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know, you know, all the research on the AIDS vaccine was put on hold once COVID broke out. This is a story of enduring struggle. Most importantly for the virus touch, HIV emergence birthed a formidable knowledge domain that composed global and planetary time spaces of infection. We know the well-told story of ownership of health and illness, the solutions and models, the initiatives and policies. Those battles have been fierce since the late 80s. In the early years, Cindy Patton's still remarkable inventing AIDS in 1990 was a landmark publication that underscored occlusions in a motivated scientific enterprise. And the book represents, of course, the many contributions of feminist and queer activists and theorists who have fought the macabre politics of letting die disposable populations, but they've also taught us much about health. The call to citizen science questioned the depoliticized relations between microbes and their therapeutic agents. Both science policy and participatory therapeutic citizenship that demanded better funding for research and better delivery systems is well documented. What is compelling about this social history are the many creative collaborations and multi-sectoral alliances at the center of the success story. Like no other, managed HIV is undoubtedly a massive distributed collective enterprise. That enterprise has transformed the location of health as the purview of medical research and practice. Health is now the care of exigent life during epidemics as craft, as practice and as knowledge production. It is a multi-form uh, enterprise rather than a deliverable good, as the health humanities now tell us. Pressing beyond medical research and practice, the health humanities emphasize care practices as knowledge production, muddying the episteme and techne theory and applied skill distinctions. Wellness regimes incorporate care as craft, social medicine extends care practices beyond clinical settings, on the ground, creative practices of care in the HIV AIDS pandemic have led the way. Institutional medical knowledge was regularly reviewed, assessed and evaluated against communal knowledge practices. Health came to be a negotiated horizon for constituting the baseline for medical decisions clinical practices and public health policies. And this is why I think the medical file is so important. You know, who contributes what to it, what is added, how the file is discussed, how the file is annotated and so on and so forth. Those negotiations involved contingent collaborations between doctors and patients for sure. But also, as we know, state officials, drug com companies, hospital administrators, clinicians, biomedical technicians, public health workers, caregivers, activists, counselors, affected uh, communities, family, friends, and lovers. So what we see at clinical points of care then is a recrafting of health and its relation to acute infectious disease emergence. I have plotted that recrafting uh, from the vantage of the blood files that organize a vital medium as it circulates from bench, from the lab, to the bedside, to the clinical point of care. Following this excorporated blood lights up a two-way street. In the one direction, 
what this is called translational biomedical research that is necessary for clinical trials on ARVs or HIV vaccines. This is the lab end of things. In the other, there are clinical clinics as points of care where blood is collected and processed, adherence monitored, and co-infections managed through chronic blood tests. The Sanjeevni Clinic and the HIV adherence clubs are string figures to recall Donna Haraway's marvelous phrase in the glo global public health story. To vivify these places is to undo a knowledge economy that builds global histories around a biomedical milestone. But more profoundly, perhaps, it is also to center localized health practices, always flexible, all often modular, as the foundations on which we have built the house of managed HIV. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Bishnu. And uh, before I introduce uh, Professor uh, Lisa Cartwright uh, as our respondent uh, for the audience here, please feel free to post questions. Um, and uh, after the response, we will have the Q&A section. Um, and uh, the more questions, the better. And uh, now it is my Pleasure to introduce our respondent today, Professor Lisa Cartwright. Lisa Cartwright is Professor of Visual Arts, Communication and Science Studies and PhD Program Director and Vice Chair in Visual Arts, as well as a faculty member in the Design Lab, the Program in Di Interdisciplinary Environmental Research and Critical Gender Studies at UCSD. Her research spans art, media, and science studies. She is the principal investigator for a Getty Foundation Pacific Standard Time Art and Science Initiative that bridges the School of Arts and Humanities with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So um, Lisa, please, and welcome. Thank you, Wentel. Um, I want to start by saying it is uh, what a great pleasure it is to have been given the honor of responding to Dr. Bishnupriya Ghosh's paper. Um, Professor Ghosh and I go way back to the field of cinema studies, even prior to the days when cinema studies had media uh, mm -hmm. and media studies as part of the title of its uh, international association and um, mm. the importance of of transiting from film studies to media studies and from media studies into um, science and technology studies in a global on a global scale and to be able to move from the individual body and the biopolitics of the individual body to the global um, is a monumental um, task for any theory, but to do it uh, in um, coming out of film and media theory into science studies is um, a, a, a giant accomplishment. And um, so I uh, was very excited about the prospect of this book many years ago when I first heard about it from Professor Ghosh at a conference. I can't even remember when, it was a while back. And so um, how she has moved from her 2011 book with, with Duke, the uh, groundbreaking global icons, which examines uh, icons in popular culture to the virus touch theorizing epidemic media um, is a subject that I would really like to explore here. And I wanna underscore that in global icons, I, I want to um, say that for those who are listening who are not coming out of film and media theory, icon study has a literature. Um, icon studies coming out of visual studies, uh, goes back to Panofsky, uh, refers to Mitchell's work on picture theory, refers to um, work on the question of, of symbols within semiotics, and then to move from that to something called the virus touch, not the viral touch, but the mm -hmm. virus touch, which I, I would like to unpack a little bit with Professor Ghosh in a little while, um, to move to the virus touch and to move to data files, to move from pictures to files, from icons to files. 
her choice of files as the focus, especially in this particular chapter, but as a thematic throughout the book, is something that I would like to talk about as a, a critical move, um, not just for this protect particular book, but for media theory and what it means for media theory. So what I'm going to do in what I hope to be a, a, a kind of more of a dialogic discussion about the talk and about this book, which is a book that I am unpacking. Um, I read the book and I feel that I am um, still unpacking it in my mind and returning to it. So my comments may be very raw and more in the, in the context of, um, as I think them, gee, how can I have this conversation? And here is the opportunity. So this will be more dialogic. So I'll move from, from media to health and medicine and um, to the question of uh, also along the way, um, this idea of not just data and data files, but craft, recrafting. Yeah. And files as things that we address, not just through the paradigm of the quantitative turn, um, thinking also through Christopher Newfield's book on, on the quantitative turn, uh, but from um, not just what's happening at the bench, but what's happening at the bedside and how we move from ben bed to bench to bedside in this book is of um, very imp great importance, I think. In, it's one of the most important things that I think that this book does. Um, how we get from the interventions in understanding data to understanding data's relationship to care. Um, and not just translationally, not just how do we translate what happens at the bench through information that we convey through media stories, through narrative, uh, through pictures to patients who don't understand data, but how that data in itself um, is uh, transits across those borders between patient and doctor and the, the multiplicity of identities um, that patients have as um, knowledge holders and that doctors have as um, information bearers that computer scientists have who, who work in this field, uh, the kind of transmutability that I think mm -hmm. this book performs is critical. So I wanna begin with um, the question, what is the intervention in media theory that is being made here? What is, um, you know, understanding, Vishnu, that you come from the field of cinema studies out of a particular formation mm -hmm. of um, critical theory that brought us to the global and that brought us through the post-colonial to the global and that brought us to um, understanding images, your whole department at, at Santa Barbara is devoted to bringing media theory to mm -hmm. uh, the understanding of the technological mm -hmm. and that does not reduce it to, um, you know, care is not there, individuals are not there. That's not about what it's about at all. So what is, how do you, how would you describe your big contribution to media theory here? Thank you, Lisa. That's um, that's a big bite. <laughs> so let me see um, uh, many things here. How I came from global icons. You know, I was trained, as you know, in postcolonial theory and film and media and visual culture. And then, of course, the question is, how did I come to grapple with data, which I am not a specialist in at all, still? informatic cultures and so on and so forth. But I see their, their regular um, uh, capture of life around us. So in some ways I've had to learn. So one of the things that um, I'll say very briefly about Global Icons, since you know the book, and that was really, you know, getting to people like Mother Teresa, this is written about in the early 2000s, came out in 2011. And I had moved to visuality actually from literature because it seemed to me that, you know, the post-colonial critique that literatures in English were really circulated among very elite coteries within the nation. And really the formation of sort of popular culture or anything pop popular were these large visual domains, right? And the icon was a way of thinking about community. And even now, if you think about, you know, um, Barack Obama or, or Martin Luther King, you actually imagine something through them. So I always thought of them as technologies 
that enable something like literally, you know, an aperture, right? Um, so I was very interested in that kind of popular uh, domain because, you know, post-colonial theory has always been against a certain kind of elitism, right, of knowledge production of uh, and, and its violences. Um, so that was the first basis. But when I began to work on global icons, I began to realize that you might have a port, you know, a poster of Mother Teresa that somebody posts on the wall in uh, in a street in Calcutta, and somebody's sleeping by it because they know the police will not remove them, right? If Mother Teresa has protected them, right? Now that whole idea. So the icon is always actually finished you know, by processes of mediation, which are social and political and haptic, right? It is much more, so I call them corporeal. You can see, Alisa, to your point that I was getting very in, interested in sort of the embodied, right? Uh, how, the embo uh, how the senses actually relate to the media that we see and visual media in, in that particular book. So there was already a turn to processes of mediation, which I think mediation has become a very troublesome term in media studies. A lot of people say, well, we need to not talk about media forms alone. We need to talk about processes of mediation because then you're looking also at, you know, um, uh, pro changes in blood, as they called it in the 19th century, processes within blood that, you know, so think about even just the fact that what we mean by saying somebody is undetectable. This is a kind of a machinic and biological entanglement, right? The machine is unable to actually detect all the viral reservoirs. Right. So there are two different processes, the biological and technological, and mostly that biotech work was done through data. I'm thinking of Eugene Thacker's books, you know, uh, which were amazing bio biomedia. And uh, so I was very interested at, you know, how this was happening elsewhere. So the second there. So that was one of how I fell into embodiment and began to think about uh, mediation more thoroughly. The second actually was two historical circumstances and which are not in the book. One of them is, one is that, you know, I come from a generation uh, that had lost a lot of people to the HIV AIDS, the pre, uh, the pre, um, uh, antiretroviral era. And that uh, was, so people were writing about trauma, uh, so on and so forth. And, but I was seeing in the worlds that I occupy in South uh, Asia that the whole struggle was still to get people on the meds, right? So there was a weird global history that was really, I wanted to get at. And part of this chapter is very much about that. And the, the second thing was, after 9-11, so much of what you say, Lisa, about quantification, I began to pay attention to quantification because of the surveillance technologies and how they distributed risk. Certain bodies were surveilled and rendered, and that was a post-colonial matter, right? Islamophobia, all of that. So when I began to look at it, I think the HIV, my, uh, my investment in the loss that we had all encountered and this other thing came together and we produced this sort of series of um, collective collaborations that produced work on risk and to think about what we mean by rendering something quantifiable. Yeah, what does it do to us? How does it shape our lives? And so I took courses in bi biology and I took courses in datafication to answer your question, to move very, I think, creakily. This book began in 2005. So it's been a very, very long while <laughs> in coming. I'll stop there. I could say much more, but I'll stop there. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, so my second question, I'm... I'm debating which second question to ask from to move to from there because I'm so interested in multiple directions here. I'm going to stick with media for a minute and um, pursue the move from blood files as pictures, which is kind of where you began the talk, and it's where you begin the chapter on blood with this very uh, evocative hook about the um, 
the blood paintings and the blood art and the exhibition in Atlanta in 1999. And um, the question of blood vials as, as tangible, blood as tangible print, electronic, as material and symbolic. Um, what isn't the domain of media studies at this point if we now necessarily move from um, the visual paradigm? You know, in my department, media is within visual arts. And um, in your department, it's cinema and media studies understood to be audiovisual with the primacy of the visual still the paradigm in which we're compelled to train because of the literatures out of which we teach. But where you're taking us is data. And that data, um, you know, the work of two people come to mind, Anne Beaulieu and um, Kelly Joyce, who both did social science analyses of um, the early MRI era. And all the scientists who said, yeah, they look like pictures, but they're not pictures. Pictures don't tell us anything. Pictures are nothing more than renderings of data. And what's really important here is data. And so what you're picking up on is the primacy of the data for visual studies and how we move from, um, from pictures to infographics. I mean, you know, my students used to get jobs doing media, meaning video and camera, and now you can go to the New York Times and uh, be a graphic designer whose work is to create infographics that take the place of articles. So what does it, this mean for visual studies and what does this mean um, for the theory of the picture in media studies in terms of, you know, blood as print, blood as electronic, blood as tangible and symbolic? Yeah, so th there are two answers to that, uh, Lisa, because the different chapters do this very differently. There is um, the one that is that would be most familiar to media studies would be the chapter on the image, you know, the, the macromolecular image. And there it's interesting what you say on uh, all of the people I deal with um, really deal with data, as you say. There are different kinds of data streams. So they're building an HIV macromolecule. There are many models of it, right? There are like six or seven models that one lab is building. And they get input from, you know, people who do cellular stuff, gen genetic stuff, et cetera, et cetera, chemistry. Uh, and then they mobilize all this data. But what they can't see is the whole picture. They need a synopsis, you know, and some of that synopsis enables you to fill out certain hunches. So the image is always speculative, you know? So the scientists often use images actually as, as, as uh, to speculate on hypotheses. And, you know, so I was dealing with labs who would sort of uh, get data from all over and build these models that all the scientists could discuss, right? So I would say that even though a lot of the medical clinical science has gone towards data, it is the image, and those of us who've studied the image and know the image and know about composition, have actually a different kind of knowledge to bring, right, to what the image is doing in these labs. And it was quite interesting because, you know, great David Goodsell, who's one of the people who's amazing also at the Scripps Institute, he used to make these watercolor paintings, you know, to scale. And uh, he's called the Rembrandt. <laughs> of you know molecular graphics uh, and uh, his color scheme and magnifications have become a kind of a grammar i call it an aesthetic grammar but they don't think of it as aesthetic grammar and he says well you know i use color because it's a natural quantifier but i'm like well but it composes it aesthetically and your senses are directed towards the object in a particular way if you make an image, right? So I had some really interesting conversations, not because scientists don't think about these things, that's not the case, right? But the emphasis falls elsewhere. So part of it was actually to think about wha what the training in making images, complicated aesthetic images, the place of that, 
you know, in, in, uh, in the datafication of life. Um, the other strain, I would say, comes from the expansion in media studies and, you know, this well from, you know, the, the media ecological read of media where, you know, elemental media, why, so it's blood, uh, saliva, semen, it's also air and soil and, you know, all of this other stuff where you need other kinds of knowledge to know it, right? So there's a media ecological and then there are media technologies like the PCR machine that render these other vital and elemental re media readable, right? We're trained in the media techno technological side and I don't think I could ever just do the other side, right? But I'm interested in that um, articulation of the one with the other, yeah? Uh, so part of it was also driven by uh, environmental media and how they have expanded what a medium should mean. And I don't think I have to tell anybody um, now about how we see the air between us. COVID-19, if anything, has taught us to see the air between us, right? We have many visualizations of it, but we constantly see viruses between you and me, right? That itself is a different kind of media. So I actually look at fecal matter, I look at blood, I look at air, along with PCR machines, cameras, you know, co computers uh, mm -hmm. together to, th to widen I think the ambit of media. So the end of the book is, um, what is it to write media theory in a pandemic? Mm -hmm. Going back to Paula Trickler's, how do we do cultural study in an epidemic, right? So, mm -hmm. and now it's not cultural study, but it's media. What is media, what are media becoming really now? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. So many wonderful associations come to mind there. Um, Peter's book on the clouds, uh, and uh, Marie Luce Nadal, who N A D A L, who is a French artist, whose medium is the clouds, and she produces clouds. And she came to this work as the granddaughter of uh, a renowned um, vineyard uh, uh, operation, where uh, you know you shoot the clouds to produce rain. And uh, so this this idea of the medium of the air, the medium of clouds and the speculative, how we, we don't just uh, represent, but nor do we simply simulate, but we produce through models. Um, so one of my questions that I wanted to ask at the end is health after HIV, in fact, um, speculative. And where do you stand on the concept of the speculative? You know, we have a speculative design major here. Um, <laughs> I'm teaching in this major and always questioning, um, you know, is the speculative, uh, what, what kind of a politics is it to embrace the speculative? And what does it mean when we think of something like HIV um, in terms of the speculative? And it brings to mind your work on the undetectable and the question of how we still operate through this notion that the test will show us an identity status which you um, uh, kind of unpack in your book on your Routledge book, your Routledge collection on risk. Um, is this a, a late modernity project in um, pushing the envelope on the real? Or is it, um, is it kind of underscoring the necessity of um, hope, the hope that comes with the speculative? I'm, I'm not sure, and I'm curious where you stand on the speculative. Um, especially relative to what we can't see and um, the pushing the margins of what we can see through testing. Yeah, and let me just say thank you for the um, Mary Louise Nadal's work. I will certainly look it up. Uh, John Durham Peters' Marvelous Crowds is absolutely seminal to you know this, uh, this discussion, of course. Um, the speculative is a big question and something that I've been working on since a UC uh, HRI residency called speculative globalities, you know, which actually produced the risk book and so on and so forth. So I've been with speculation for a very long time. Um, the relation to HIV is actually an excellent one because that's where I end up in this talk. But I think about speculation as a form of knowledge 
that thinks in the vicinity of the unknown. So it's a form of partial knowledge, right? And so you're always projecting and the calcul the quantification part is of course, estimates and assessments and predictions, forecasts, so on and so forth. We know this and the modeling that uh, goes on. And I think there's one part of speculation that can be predatory, you know, that you can do the estimates. And of course, I'm at risk for X kind of cancer. So my healthcare thing goes up, right? So that's a, it, so you can monetize it. Yeah. Uh, but there is another kind of uh, speculation, which I think is affirmative speculation. And I've been, you know, we've, some of us have written on this. Um, so for instance, if you think of, uh, you know, one example that I always give my students is the neem plant, you know, that is very important uh, uh, to India. Um, uh, the, uh, there's a US company that tried to patent it for spermicidal and other things, right? So that is to take one set of possibilities of the neem plant, right? And monetize it and to think it can do this. But the neem plant is also planted, it has anti-desertification quality properties. Uh, it's cool and it brings water. So um, what going down one pathway, the predatory speculation does is to close off other avenues, right? And I think this has happened with uh, a, a managed HIV in the sense that we tend to, and Cindy Patton actually has written uh, uh, about this as well, that we tend to privilege the viral load and we should, right? But it actually sometimes people will just look at the viral load and kind of what's happening to the liver or what's happening in other parts of the body, uh, taking off Ayurveda or Chinese medicine that can help systemic health, right? Um, all of this sort of falls out of the equation, those kinds of life ways, which are also speculative. We don't, they will not yield one result always, right? They're contingent. So I think I'm very interested in this kind of provisional, open-ended, affirmative speculation, which was, I think, a hallmark of managing HIV under precarious circumstances. And I think activist communities were remarkable in the way, way they shared their knowledge transnationally and made it. I'm thinking of Jonathan Mann, who's no, no longer with us, and his push for, you know, drugs for everybody, you know, all of, so that kind of uh, speculative moving down a different kind of knowledge paradigm, uh, which I think is, has, is very productive for thinking about health in a much more broader dimension, which is local and craft-like in one of your questions, or, you know, it's craft-like because you're constantly making it, right? contingently. Um, and so it's never finished. The task is never finished. Um, I, I'm sort of, I, I like that end of speculation. That's great. And I loved hearing about neem, which I have gallons of in my shed for my plants. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's an, neem is a very interesting project. It's a dissertation, um, neem and mediation. Um, oh yeah. Standing. I mean, it's, it's a, there's a goddess called Sitala in Bengal, who's the goddess of smallpox. And oh. part of her worship is with Neem. And really? it's always in the spring, just around smallpox season, outbreak season. And one of the reasons is that the cooling properties of Neem, if you put it, make a paste and you put it on the sores, your sores won't fly about and infect other people. Wow. So the worship itself, eating of curds to cool your body, it's a different form of health. It's sort of, you know, indigenous knowledge, but I think that is also speculative and it's much more multifaceted than looking at X amount of virus and Y amount of blood. So, so interesting. I would love to talk more about that um, apart from this forum where I wanna end with a question about health and about care. So um, just as I began with the question about your intervention in media theory, clearly uh, you're making a major intervention in theories of health, which I would take to be to the paradigm against health, citing um, Jonathan Metzl's book, uh, the work that's going on that, um, that rejects the normative demands of 
outcomes. Um, I, I uh, received with great appreciation the fact that Greg Bordowitz, who uh, was critical to the idea of living with AIDS, not dying from AIDS, has become the director of the Whitney Independent Study Program, which is one of the major training grounds for the kind of critical theory in which Professor Ghosh, you and I have been involved in for a long time, to have somebody coming out of the living with AIDS media generation of video art, who is now embracing this um, turn to the, quanti the quantitative and information um, in, a, in a museum, in an art museum context, in a training context that's been devoted to critical theory for so long. So what, um, what do you see as what you're bringing to health studies, to science and technology studies around biomedicine. I could say a lot of things it's about all the wonderful things you bringing, but for you, what's the most important thing or what are the most important things that you are bringing to that domain as a voice in that domain? Yeah, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a really interesting question because I think the really hard part of the book has been to talk about the global, social, political stuff, in which to say HIV AIDS, managed HIV is a distributed collective enterprise. I mean, everybody know, knows that, we know that. It's a well-told story. It's, it's you know, <laughs> talking about Greg uh, would, you know, is one of the people who made it so, right? That's, there are generations of activists. So there's nothing new for, for, for activists there. Um, I think it is important to one of the things that I've tried to do is all the activist uh, uh, collectives I've talked to, they had no time. When I asked them for archives, they were like, what archives? We were, too, <laughs> we were just trying to keep abreast. And one of the things, the book has an archival sort of tendency to circulate their stories. You know, like things like the MSF 2.0 differentiated delivery model, where they don't mention Fanel Vagashu and how she began, right? So there is that part of it. I did, it's not recuperative, it really, but there is part of it is devoted to that. So I, I want to, in that sense, it's additive to some of the things we know. But I think a lot of my global critical health people don't want to hear about the planetary story. Right, that when I say this is an ecological catastrophe, <laughs> they say, well, the human is not one thing, et cetera. And I'm like, you know, we got to hold these things together because otherwise we are going to have these viruses come at us every time. And, you know, what did we do? We had pharma capitalism and HIV. What did we do with COVID? We had vaccine capitalism. We're going to be doing this, you know. So, so I think it's a story that has to settle there and my other side, my environmental health colleagues um, and my digital environmental health people don't want to hear about the global story of resistance and struggle. I mean, they don't not want to hear it, but they think it's too anthropocentric. And I'm like, you know, the pandemic is not the same. This is the second book. Epidemic intensity is not the same for everybody. It has never, no pandemic has ever been the same for everybody everybody. So we got to attend to the fact that some people are always culled. It's literally a population culling. So, you know, so that's been the struggle. And uh, if, you know, I know you're reading it now, you'll feel the, the change of gears, which is sometimes clunky, and it, it registers in the language. So I don't know if that uh, that answers your question, but I'm really after uh, thinking about health as a multi-form horizon in which different ways of thinking about health may not sit comfortably together. Thank you. That's such such a, an inviting answer to so many more questions that I hope we can pursue at another time, especially concerning the, the multi-species and the zoonotic dimensions relative to what you were just speaking about. But I want to turn the floor back to Wen Tao because I know he's collecting a lot of questions about, um, about your talk from the audience. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Always great talking to you. Likewise.
All right. Uh, so thank you. Thank you both uh, for this wonderful um, sort of dialogic style of response. And uh, to all the audience members, uh, please feel free to submit questions. And uh, I want to ask a question uh, uh, that I have regarding a paragraph in the uh, conclusion uh, of your book, Media Theory in a Pandemic, where you put together uh, the, uh, the concept of thick temporality. And I'm going to read uh, this short paragraph. Um, uh, and uh, the present seems to all too slow and simultaneously, simultaneously vanishing under the weight of pandemic past and pandem pandemic ep uh, epidemic past and pandemic pandemic futures, we can scarcely hold on to the now in the untimeliness of pandemic urgencies, this thick temporality structures epidemic media. Nothing is ever enough or complete. Something out there beckons. Patent recognition from past everything we have, we have learned about spiked orbs, about vital media, about reservoir hosts, acquires value opening myriad trajectories into the future. Um, yeah, so I want, I, I, I personally, I find this uh, concept of thick temporality very relevant. And especially when it comes to how, you know, the response, uh, sort of collective response uh, towards the virus, for example, uh, our attitude towards mask, towards vaccination, right? Because uh, there has there has never been a gr greater sort of uh, uh, greater discussion amount uh, regarding if the mask works or if the vaccination works, if we should promote vaccination mandate, um, and especially with the mask because you know, we don't really see the effect of those, you know, preventive approaches immediately. There is a time sort of time gap between, okay, we, the time we, um, we practice those methods and the time when we see the effect of those methods, there, there is a time sort of gap and, and, and you, and people, if they don't really see that immediate response or immediate effect of those approaches, they might, this time can also be used for them to grow doubt, to, to grow questions regarding the efficiency of those, um, um, those approaches. So I, I think to some extent that also sort of speak to this kind of thick temporality regarding this kind of interplay between past and the future um, and, and, you know, in terms of this attitude towards those kind of preventive approaches. So can you sort of wave into how, what the, the role of time in sort of collective uh, response to the virus? during that that you have re witnessed during the you know covid-19 during the you know past years of pandemic yeah thanks uh, for that question uh, vento it's um it's a big question and a difficult one <laughs> i keep uh, uh, having to tell people i'm still thinking about covid-19 <laughs> but i think it's it, if the point of the book is what have we learned from epidemics past to think about this one, then I think it's totally on point. Um, so the thick temporality I came to for two reasons. One is the kind of experience of um, uh, of the epidemic experience as a thick time, by which I mean that you know we kept thinking about the uh, the the 1918 flu right, was the point of reference, right, because it was global, and so so there are many pan pandemics that came cascading. <laughs> many pasts sort of thickly present in this present. For me, it was HIV. It was never the 1918 flu for many reasons, right? That I, that I won't elaborate. So there were, it, it seemed like packed, pasts were packed on top of each other. And at the same time, the, it seemed the pandemic went on forever as everybody you know, kept saying. So time was too, too, too much and too slow. Yeah, and then speeding ahead, 
okay? Because uh, as CDC kept telling us, you know, do this and do that. And then we'd say, oh, but last week you said X and now you're telling us that it's Y, right? Get your messaging straight, right? So the speed of trying to, so there was, I think it's the pandemic experience skews time right? In, in a way that I was trying to say there's a kind of a thick temporality there. But I also wanted to use it in Clifford Geertz's idea of, you know, thick description of, as an analytic, like there, are, there is a social and time of pandemics, there is the ecological time is, its scale is massive. HIV was in the Cameroon early part of the 20th century, right? It only emerges HIVM in 19, uh, well, 81 is the first recorded case, but it's 1959 is the first case, right? So there's all this weird temporal, uh, the ecological, the biological, the, uh, which is the rate of mutation. There are many kinds of, so the thickness of temporality was drawing attention to the different orders of association along which the pandemic unfolds. And they're not necessarily causally related, right? Mm -hmm. Social time, political time, uh, ecological time, biological time, different modes. So if you can see it as a kind of a thick, literally thick time as an analytic that way. Um, in terms of uh, uh, you, the idea of the doubt, this gap, I think that has to do with uncertainty, like, you know, facts had not crystallized. And things because because of the novelty and this is emergence is something new right we didn't know what it was even the scientists were telling us look we just can give you only this much right now remember when we were first thinking of it as droplet born and there was a whole discussion as it's particulate born you know and everybody's trying to follow the research right uh so that that's i think to do with a certain kind of epidemic uh, uh, urgency where uncertainty is the primary condition, right? That uh, even though we're told about risk again and again, risk always try to tries to capture uncertainty. But I think in pandemic emergencies, that's very difficult, right? Okay, so that's, that's one about that. I think one of the most interesting things I've read about this is you see Parika and Tony Sampson's essay in cultural politics in which they talk about the mathematical curve you know, and they say this is a media form which actually can keep up with the temporality, the thick temporality of epidemics, because, you know, you hear some misinformation that COVID doesn't exist, right? So you don't wear your mask. So in your neighborhood, the infection goes up, right? So the, the, there is a feedback loop be between social behavior, information, as well as biological, muta you know, agency, right? And the curve actually is a live stream, right, that shows that. So yeah, that, I think there are media that are attuned to thick temporality, if that answers your question, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you so much. And uh, we are actually right on time. So um, thank you so much. And this is the last event and the last talk of this series. So um, uh, thank you so much for everyone uh, who made a huge effort. Um, and also season two is on its way uh, in the next year. So um, I hope that, you know, uh, I can bring more hybrid version of this talk uh, to uh, both on campus and via Zoom. So, uh, you know, more people can have this um, can can participate in a more vivid fashion. So uh, thank you so much, Vishnu and Lisa, and also Rihanna for uh, making this possible. And uh, I'll see you next year. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.